Good morning, everyone. We are all so pleased to be here today. Members of the CMS, um, as we call it, staff are in the audience, and these are the people who work for you every day. These are the people who have the privilege and the joy of getting up every single day and working with our beneficiaries. And we're here today to celebrate a very important birthday. Medicare and Medicaid turn 50 today, as, as some of you just heard. So I want to thank you all for joining us at this very special time, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Medicare and Medicaid program. And I really want to thank the center here for having us today. Velma, big thanks to you. Uh, I know how hard you've worked with us. And I also want to thank Joyce Gallagher, who is in our office. I think we all know Joyce, the executive director of the Chicago Area Agency on Agency. Thank you for coming. No program has changed the lives of Americans more in the last 50 years than Medicare and Medicaid. 50 years ago, the landscape of health care in America changed forever when President Johnson signed the landmark amendment to the Social Security Act. And it gave life to the Medicare and the Medicaid program. And they started out as very basic insurance programs for those who did not help have health insurance, but they have become the standard for coverage, quality, and innovation in the American health care system. Before 1966, roughly half of all seniors were uninsured. That meant they were uh, possibly living in fear that the high cost of health care could propel them not only them, but their families too, into poverty. And before Medicaid, far too many people with disabilities, families with children, pregnant women, and low-income working Americans were unable to afford the medical care that they needed to stay healthy and productive. Later, the Medicare Modernization Act was signed into law by President George W. Bush in December of 2003, and it was at that point that Medicare added a prescription drug benefit to Medicare. We call it Medicare Part D, and you can hear about it today with some of our exhibitors that are here for you. It also added some preventive services, and that was a real turning point that we began to see the importance of prevention in our healthcare system. And then, finally, uh, not all so long ago, on March 23, 2010, the Affordable Care Act was signed into law by President Obama, and it was upheld by the Supreme Court in June of 2002. And this law did a lot of things. It created the marketplace for the uninsured, but it also expanded the life of the Medicare Trust Fund to at least 2029. That's a 12-year extension, and we are able to do that because the law itself provides for reductions in waste, fraud, and abuse, and other Medicare costs. And that's good for beneficiaries, and that's good for taxpayers. Today, Medicare and Medicaid cover nearly one out of every three Americans. That's well over 100 million people. About 55 million Americans depend on Medicare to cover 23 types of preventive services. In, that includes your flu shot, that includes your diabetes screenings, and others. Medicare also covers hospital stays, lab tests, and critical supplies like wheelchairs, as well as prescription drugs. Now, Medicaid provides comprehensive coverage to nearly 71 million eligible, eligible children, pregnant women, low-income adults, and people living with disabilities. Approximately one in five non-elderly Americans are now receiving essential services uh, like annual checkups, care for new and expecting mothers, and dental care for children. Medis Medicaid is providing a healthy start for nearly one in three children in our country. That's roughly 33 million children who are covered now. So what about the next 50 years? As we look to the, to the next 50 years and beyond, Medicare and Medicaid have an important role to play in the evolution of the nation's healthcare system. 
We are at CMS working very hard to modernize the healthcare system to deliver better care, spend our healthcare dollars more wisely, and provide better access and a higher quality care as a result. We are finding better ways to ensure that the right care is accessible and delivered to the right person at the right time, every time. We are working to deploy tools, such as electronic health records, to improve the coordination of patient care and lower costs. And CMS has set an ambitious goal and a timeline to move the Medicare program and the healthcare system at large toward paying providers based on the quality of the care delivered rather than the quantity or how much care they deliver. I've mentioned our staff that are in the audience. If you'd all kind of raise your hand, feel free to, uh, to uh, talk with any of us. Um, every day, our employees are making a difference through their work in the lives of Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries, and now the marketplace consumers as well. We see ourselves as dedicated teams working to provide Americans with access to the quality care they need, fostering innovation, combating fraud, and protecting taxpayers and patients. And that will be our goal for the next 50 years. At this time, I'd like to invite uh, my colleague, Kathleen Falk, someone I'm glad to call a friend, um, up to say a few words. Kathleen is the Regional Director for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Kathleen? Thank you, Jackie, and thank you for your leadership. Uh, Jackie Garner is not only the Regional Administrator right here for us, uh, for CMS, but she is a national leader. Uh, for Medicare and Medicaid programs, and we are really lucky to have her right here in the Chicago office. Thank you so very much. Um, and uh, good morning to all. Um, I am going to turn 65 next summer, so I'm pretending this party is for me. <laughs> right? Um, I also want to give a shout out to our congressmen and women uh, who would have loved, I am sure, to be here at this celebration, but they're all in Washington working for us. But I know several were able to send some staff. I think uh, Congresswoman Chikowski's office is here and maybe others. So I, we want to give a big shout out to what Congress does every single day to make sure these programs stay strong for all of us. Um, in addition to the, the incredible statistics that, that uh, Jackie Garner just provided, uh, just this week, uh, the Center for Medicaid Services has released the, the brand new numbers of Medicaid and Medicare. And, kind of drilling it down to how increasingly important this, this important law is. And when it began 50 years ago, there were about 19 million people in Medicare. And just now, the newest numbers are 55 million, with 3 million increase in the last three years, thanks to us baby boomers like us. So it's only becoming more and more important. And to drill it down a little further, that means in Illinois, over 2 million seniors are now enjoying uh, the important Medicare and Medicaid Advantage services. Um, well, just as Jackie said, with Medicare and Medicaid growing these 50 years, we now have an additional great improvement also in our health care, and that's the Affordable Care Act. Have you heard about that recently? <laughs> um, since the passage of the Affordable Care Act, now another 16.4 million people have health insurance that didn't have it before. That is the largest reduction of the number of uninsured in four decades. We are making progress. We have more to do, as Jackie said. And since the first full year of the Affordable Care Act implementation, we're now seeing additional results beyond people getting great health care, and that is it's reducing the cost of health care, and that benefits all of us. For example, it saved about 300 uh, in $16 million in Medicaid alone because of the lower health care costs. That's good news uh, for our nation and for all of us individually. We know now that Medicare, Medicaid, the Affordable Care Act are completely transforming health care. And we are lucky now this morning to enjoy a great panel discussion of the leaders, the advocates, and the experts who will talk to us about this really exciting time in healthcare and what we have to look forward to in the future as well. Thank you.
Kathleen's a little taller than me, so I can pull this down. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing and moderating the panel today. Um, some, some of these um, individuals I've known for many, many years, and um, I, I'm just so honored that they joined us this morning. So let me make some initial introductions, and then I'm going to ask each to make some opening remarks. And uh, we will um, then soon open it up to you, the audience, for questions. So to my right is Nadine Israel, the policy director with EverThrive, Illinois. EverThrive works to improve the health of women, children, and families right here in Illinois. They and two, um, under its previous name, which you may uh, know them, as the uh, Illinois Maternal and Child Advocate uh, advocate for all kids. Um, Nadine is the previous policy manager at um, uh, the Heartland Alliance where she worked on expanding Medicaid and I see that I jumped ahead and we have a video to share <laughs> so I'll be back. Medicaid means the world to me. Once I hit 65 and could go on Medicare it was a huge relief. I'm just really thankful for the, for the health insurance. I'm getting emotional. President and Mrs. Johnson and Vice President Humphrey arrive for ceremonies that will make the Medicare bill a part of Social Security coverage. I remember in 1965 when the bill was signed for Medicare. July 30th, 1965, my first year in Congress, we were able to pass both Medicare and Medicaid. Since LBJ signed that law 50 years ago, we've been able to work on and improve and make sure that all of those folks have care. Since I was 14, I've been working and, and drawing a paycheck and contributing. I was self-employed. Uh, I had to pay for any insurance. It was very, very expensive. And now I've been uh, on Medicare for six years, and it just adds uh, a lot of peace of mind. When my mom got covered, I felt like it would take a big burden off of her financially. Twelve weeks ago, I ruptured a tendon in my foot and found out that I needed surgery. Medicare has given me the opportunity to get everything I need to make a full recovery. I am extremely excited about her getting healthy again without having to take on additional financial burdens. There are actually very few programs that have changed the nation this much and changed the lives of so many as Medicare and Medicaid. I'm a working mom. I, um, I'm a home healthy and I go to seniors' homes that's either sick and bound, can't get around. If they need to get washed, I help them get washed. I help prepare their meals, make sure they take their meds. And my job, it was no way for me to afford the health care. Like if I gotten sick, you know, then it would be $40 to go to the doctor. So either I had to not pay a bill, which was either my mortgage or utility bill, or I had to kind of diagnose myself. I heard from a navigator that Medicaid had expanded. We did the application online. I found out that I was covered. That was a great day. When I first got my insurance card, I went to the doctors, and I was only going to go get a physical. So to come to find out that I have big fibroid tumors that I have to get a hysterectomy for, and I also have precancerous cells. Since I have coverage, I can get it taken care of and be healthy. Medicaid and Medicare are programs that provide incredible health security, but they also provide very important financial security. There's no question that for the last 50 years, Medicare and Medicaid have been keeping us healthy. And now I'm going to turn this over to Joyce Gallagher um, to say a few words.
Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. On behalf of Mayor Emanuel, I'd like to welcome all of you to this center, and I would like everyone to give a round of applause to our seniors that are here today. The seniors that are here today have built Chicago, and we are so proud of each and every one of you. And also, just so you know, our mayor was chief of staff when the Affordable Care Act was passed. He was chief of staff under President Obama. So we're very, very proud of the heritage and also the contributions, not only of this mayor, but of each person that is a senior here um, in the center. And this center is just one of 21 centers throughout the city of Chicago. And I'm proud to say that each and every one of our centers has SHIP volunteers and helps everyone every single day get the benefits that they so richly deserve. And so I want to thank um, Myra Salazar, who's been working with us, and Brenda Delgado, um, have, have worked with us very, very closely over the years to make sure that we have everything that we need for our seniors. So I just want to say again, Thank you, congratulations, and thank you to our federal um, partners. They're not only partners, they're the initiators, and so we're so grateful that everything works so well and that we are able to provide these services. So welcome, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Joyce. And uh, wasn't that a great video? It, it really brings home the, the, the difference that these programs make in people's lives. Um, as I go back to our panel now, I, I also want to point out that we have resources here available to you. And while we are so excited about Medicare and Medicaid turning 50, our partners in Social Security are celebrating their 80th birthday, so they, they told me we have nothing on them. So, um, so continuing with our pa panel, you all know Nadine now. Um, let me also, to uh, her right, introduce Henry Taylor, the president and CEO of Miles Square Health Center. Uh, those of you who are not familiar with Miles Square, it is a federally qualified health center. It is aligned with the University of Illinois in Chicago and has expanded to 10 Chicago sites after the ACA. It provides mental health services in partnership with the Metropolitan Family Services. And Mr. Taylor has been with the Miles Square since 1998. He is also chairman of the board for the Illinois Primary Health Care Association. So I want to thank you, Henry, for coming today. It's a very distinguished, um, very distinguished career. Um, to my left um, is Barbara Otto, the ex executive director of the Health and Disability Advocates. HDA is a national leader on advocating for health access and disability issues. HDA is promoting the 25th anniversary of the Americans Disabilities Act this month through social and earned media and community events. And HDA is also one of the founding members of the Make Medicare Work Coalition, Illinois Health Matters, and the Small Business Health Collaborative. And I can tell you from my past experience that working with Barbara, she is um, the leading advocate in Illinois on disability. So I know you have a busy schedule, and I want to thank you for coming today, too. And to Barbara's left is Jonathan Levin, Age Options uh, MMW. And the Age Options is the Suburban Cook County Area Agency on Aging. John is a founding member of the Make Medicare Work Coalition, the MMW thus. And Age Options is, state, is a statewide grantee for the Illinois Senior Medicare Patrol. Uh, their annual fundraiser theme, Celebrating Milestones, is commemorating its 50th anniversary also. So with that, I'm going to turn to, um, I think we'll just start perhaps, John, with you and come this way and um, uh, give you an opportunity to say a few words, and then I have a follow-up question. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me all right? Um, this is really exciting. I've been in this 
field of aging for 41 years. And I started with the Chicago um, Office on Aging and uh, left there for the age options about 36 years ago. And uh, when we look at where older people were when I entered the field and where people were before the advent of Social Security, uh, not Social Security, but Medicare and Medicaid in my lifetime, and of course Social Security is so major in all of our lifetimes, um, we can see that there's been real progress and really important advances in the wealth, uh, fare, and health of our older population. Um, we we uh, have looked at health care issues for over 15 years uh, in terms of the fact that there were so many changes going on even before uh, uh, the Make Medicare Work Coalition was developed. There was issues related to do I go join a health maintenance organization? If I join a health maintenance organization, do I know what services, programs I have access to and which ones I don't? So Age Option started a health care choices program to really try to educate folks on making important decisions related to um, the uh, apparently free uh, uh, managed care policies that were available at the time. And over this time, we were advised at that time that one thing we could bet on is that healthcare changes. And we were told not to think in terms of a three-year plan to serve a particular group, but to think every year to reassure that we are reaching those who are most impacted by the changes in health care. And the Affordable Care Act uh, has been the most recent effort, but when Part D of Medicare was enacted, there was a major tsunami of, of requests and informations and decisions that were occurring, and that's the origin of the Make Medicare Work Coalition. And uh, at that time, uh, Barb Otto at my right here really was a major uh, driver to assure that we looked at enrolling people in Part D, the prescription assistance programs, uh, that were not only in the older part of the Medicare population, but also the, the disabled. And uh, foundations in the Chicago area brought us together and said, we know that Age Options was working on health care choices. We know that there's issues related to the disability community. And what we want to do is try to set up a, a, a resource that truly responded to all of the professionals and individuals who are working in the community to help it, people with decisions related to their health care. And some of these decisions, I've, we, we just get incensed when, some dis, uh, when there's delays in getting people into Medicare, when people did not make a choice on Part D, because there are lifetime implications of not making the best decisions. So we got together and we added the, our, uh, our or another organization in Suburban Cook, Progress Center for Independent Living, and created a program that now reaches over 1,100 people uh, in terms of providing them professional support and resources to guide them through the types of problems that individuals face when they make choices on their Medicare or their Medicaid coverage. And we've uh, grown and we've developed and we've been supported by privately through a number of foundations. Uh, Michael Reese Health Trust, uh, Retirement Research Foundation, and the Chicago Community Trust are our angels, and they have believed and invested in us to try to be sure that we reach as many people in community settings who will then be able to guide their uh, customers and their supporters uh, to make good decisions. We've done this by using translations in Marta Korea and Cleese has been major in terms of helping us with the translations, as well as assuring that the ethnic communities have access to uh, the, the information that we've developed. And we've also had some in-kind contributions in terms of providing translations. We also have been very much involved in uh, providing webinars. We've served in the last 10 years that the Make Medicare Work uh, Coalition has existed about 10,000 professionals have been trained, about 1,000 a year. And we're, we're very pleased that we are here today to be able to honor and celebrate Medicare and Medicaid after, uh, on their 50th. Just last week, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Older Americans Act, which is dear to my heart since Age Options has its primary funding through the Older Americans Act. And of course, um, we, um, 
we want to recognize the uh, a, um, Americans with Disability Act, which is celebrating 25 years. So this is a major landmark milestone year, and our organization reached out to some of our partners in the managed care organizations that we work with, and, there's a, and they helped us celebrate, and we're spending this entire year celebrating those milestones, from our volunteer recognition to our receptions to our major fundraising event in October. This is the year of milestones, and it's Medicare, Medicaid, Older Americans Act, and 80 years of Social Security, and of course, 25 years of uh, Americans with disability. We are so honored to be part of this today. Thank you. Thank you, John. I, I have one follow-up question for Great. John. Okay. Um, and John, since Age Options also serves as the Illinois Senior Medicare Patrol, could you share some of the latest fraud schemes that you're hearing about that might help our beneficiaries? Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, in 1995, I went to the White House Conference on Aging in Washington, and there was thousands of people there, and the newly elected President Clinton announced the fact that, um, he, that one of the major strategies for assuring the stability and long-term reliability of Medicare was the involvement and investment of those who received the services from Medicare. So we were one of the first organizations to be invited to be part of, uh, of the Senior Medicare Patrol Program. And the Senior Medicare Patrol Program basically uh, in, involves volunteers and community organizations to spread the message that Medicare is our program. And the only way we really can assure that that program is there when we really need it is to try to combat and reduce waste, fraud, and abuse of Medicare resources. And we've been seeing over time that um, many, well, I remember going to Washington, D.C. And, and, te and testifying at a, at a hearing on uh, fraud and abuse. And somebody came in with handcuffs on their hands and uh, sat down, and he was billing Medicare from a location right in the middle of the Miami uh, airport. So we know that most of the fraud is provider fraud, but and th those providers pro that fr provider fraud preys on older people and disabled people, and what we've seen often and consistently for the uh, number of years that we've been involved in SMP since 1995, that home health services people go around and uh, take people and drop off brochures and then claim that and get Medicare numbers and then start billing for home health services, which at times have had lifetime limits. And uh, it just, it's unconscionable. And we've been fighting that from day one. We've seen that um, uh, durable medical equipment be delivered to people who have no need for it and have the, and because of somehow that they've accessed their Medicare number, that's been billed. We've seen uh, fraudulent or medically unnecessary physician services. What you do is you uh, look at your explanation of benefits, and you protect your, uh, social, uh, your Medicare number, and you report if anything doesn't smell right. And that's been our message from day one. It's a mighty important one, and it's one that uh, happens way too often. And I'm going to take one more second. I got a call yesterday telling me that I, I'm running out of time to renew my car, my automobile maintenance agreement. And I had already bought a five-year agreement. So there, there's people who are really and truly out there to steal money from us. And it's up to all of us to be sure that we question, we look for credentials, and we do our best to stop that before it preys on us. And I would just add, you know, our little commercial here that Medicare will never, ever call you and ask you for your number. So um, just you. hang up. Thanks, John. That's a really important message. No, Barbara. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. This is really an auspicious week uh, for me personally and professionally. It's the 25th anniversary of the ADA. It's the 50th anniversary of Medicaid and Medicare, and the 96th birthday of my grandmother, Naomi Otto, uh, tomorrow. And I think in, in speaking of and bringing up my grandmother, I think it's a great illustration of the importance of Medicaid and Medicare. You know, my grandmother has uh, worked all her life, um, is 96, living independently, and has been using Medicare faithfully. 
Um, but now she's starting to run out of assets. And this is where Medicaid really comes in and why these two programs are so important for not only older adults like my grandma Naomi, but also people with disabilities. A little known secret is that 49% and probably after this year, closer to 50 to 55% of long-term care services and supports in the United States are paid for by Medicaid. And I think that's a really important figure for all of us to understand because it is a really important issue that older adults and people with disabilities are able to live in their communities and live in their own homes. Health and disability advocates for the past 24 years has been working on behalf of older adults and people with disabilities. As a matter of fact, we were founded by uh, the Older Women's League, uh, working with a range of disability groups, including the Council for Disability Rights. And so we've come together over the years to work with our partners um, as is Age Options and Progress Center for Independent Living, because we really understand that intersection of economic and healthcare security for both people with disabilities and older adults. I think the Affordable Care Act helped propel that original vision that I have to say that President Truman really started, uh, my favorite president, of moving forward and saying we cannot be a world power unless we take care of our most important resource, which is our people. And no older American should have to be poor in order to be taken well care of. So that was the genesis of Medicare. The ACA advances that promise. It eliminates um, discrimination against uh, people with disabilities who maybe had pre-existing conditions and offers millions of more Americans the opportunity of coverage. And I do have to say that as a presidential appointee on the advisory group for prevention, health promotion, and integrative public health, I hope every senior in this room has taken advantage of their preventive services under Medicare. So if you have not, if you have not received a mammogram, if you have not gone to get your physical, you need to know that there's no copay. I have to tell people all the time, older adults, that you need to go and take care of yourself. So that's another advancement that we've been able to do. The ACA now propels us in looking at how do we look at prevention and health promotion. People with disabilities and older adults are living longer and living stronger, and we need all of these pieces to work together. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. And since she mentioned President Harry Truman, who was the first advocate, mm -hmm. a little known fact is that he has the, and his wife have card num Medicare card number one and Medicare card number two. So it's on display at the Presidential Library. Um, as a follow-up question, Barbara, uh, what are some of the biggest challenges that people with disabilities experience in trying to enroll or access Medicare services, and, and, and how might we overcome some of sure. those. I think some of the biggest challenges that we've especially seen in the last, um, since the Medicare Modernization Act, is people with disabilities, especially those with communication barriers, um, have a really hard time understanding uh, why they need to enroll in Medicare Part D. I'm finding lots of, especially individuals who are profoundly deaf, uh, ending up with late enrollment penalties because they say, oh, I have my Medicare card. Why do I need to be enrolling in Medicare Part D? And we actually have been working with the CMS Ombudsman uh, in Washington, D.C., in Baltimore. And how can we make uh, the communications for people with disabilities, especially those with communication barriers, much more understandable? But I have to say it's not just people with disabilities. Uh, one of my board members, someone who has been around uh, the block on Medicare uh, just came to me the other day and he has a late enrollment penalty. So I think there's a lot of confusion around when do you need Medicare Part D. And so there are lots of things I hope we can be doing together to improve access to that important program. Thank you. That's, um, that's something I did not know, so thank you. I'm going to take a moment here before I turn um, uh, to our next panelist and recognize um, two um, staff members are here from local congressional staff. So if you kind of raise your hand, uh, Chris uh, Satter. Sater is here from Congressman Jan Schakowsky's office, and also uh, Melanie Thompson ah, is in Hi. the back. 
from um, Mike Quigley's office. Welcome. We're glad you could join us. Um, so we'll turn it to you now, um, uh, Nadine. And Good morning. Again, uh, my name is Nadine Israel. I am the policy director at Everthrive, Illinois. I'm going to adjust this a little bit. So Everthrive, uh, we used to be the Illinois Maternal and Child Health Coalition. Um, and what we do is we work to improve the health and uh, of women, children, families over the lifespan through community engagement, partnerships, uh, policy analysis, education, and advocacy. We actually um, started in 1988. We, it was a, a group of public health professionals um, and advocates that got together and formed a coalition at the time to um, ensure and expand access for, to, to Medicaid for pregnant women. Um, and so that was our first victory. Since then, we have worked with many other advocates and providers in Illinois to ensure access for all children. Um, so all kids um, is now what that program is called. Um, and that covers Medicaid, uh, that covers all kids in Illinois up to 300% of poverty um, through the Medicaid program. Um, so that was a huge victory. That sort of was our second large victory. And we spent years working to implement that, that program and that policy and that law. Um, most recently, we work to expand Medicaid for the single uh, adult through the Affordable Care Act. Um, and that was, you know, it was signed in Illinois um, in 2013. And um, so some statistics in Illinois, we've got 1.6 million Illinois kids on all kids um, to date. Um, for parents, care caretaker relatives, and pregnant women, we've got about 657,000 people on Medicaid th through that piece of Medicaid. And the single adult, we've got about 538,000 um, because of the, the Affordable Care Act that have access to Medicaid now. So altogether, I think it's about 3.2 million people on Medicaid in Illinois, um, which, is, which is about one in four in terms of our population. Um, so a huge program that covers, you know, from the perspective of Everthrive Illinois, we really uh, want to make sure that women, pregnant women, kids, um, families really have access to the health insurance and the health coverage that they, that they need. Um, our role in all of these um, throughout this, these years and the last 27 years um, in Medicaid and expansion of Medicaid has really been to convene groups to come together to sort of work to advocate and move a, a, a policy solution. Um, once we've done that, we've been able to work on the implementation piece. So when a, law, uh, when a policy becomes law, then you have to work on spreading the word and doing outreach and making sure that pe people are able to take advantage of that. Um, and so most recently what we've done, um, once Medicaid was expanded through the Affordable Care Act, is we were actually able to partner with the Shriver Center to create an online assistance tool called Help Hub. And what that does is the, the navigators, that's the, the video mentioned the navigator, those people that are out there in the community um, that provide free in-person assistance uh, to help enroll in health coverage, whether it's Medicaid or the marketplace, uh, we were able to create this online tool that uh, basically answered their question. So there was about 1,500 users, um, and we would sort of answer the question within a 24-hour um, time period. At the latest, usually it was within a couple hours. And that, what that allowed them to do is be able to come to one website in Illinois if they were sort of assisting, put up a question whether it was about uh, enrolling an immigrant that has, uh, that's having trouble sort of getting through the system or understanding what a child um, who's in a mixed status family when it comes to immigration qualifies for. Um, so sort of a myriad uh, array of questions that we're able to assist with uh, through Help Hub. We are very excited um, to have been a part of this, this journey of Medicaid uh, over the past 27 years. And I certainly look forward to uh, continuing to work uh, to improve the Medicaid program, certainly improve access, uh, making sure that now we've got access to millions of people on Medicaid, that we make sure that it's meaningful access in terms of being able to reach a provider, a primary care provider, behavioral health, um, you know, getting medications filled, specialty care, things like that. Um, so I really look forward to, to continuing to work on, on that, those pieces. Uh, and I'm happy to be here. 
Nadine, there's absolutely no doubt that your organization has helped to get so many children in Illinois enrolled in uh, first kid care and then all kids. Um, my question for you is, having um, been working on this for a long time now, um, what have you learned that community members, especially grandparents for some of our seniors here, can do to help get uninsured children covered? Yeah, so it was really actually, um, I was uh, um, sort of speaking with someone earlier about, it was really interesting for me to go back through sort of our archives as an organization, look through pictures um, and all the materials that we used back when we were doing outreach and enrollment around uh, kid care. Um, and you know, it's a lot of the same strategies, the same things that work then, um, that worked for us when we were working on um, doing outreach and education for adults through Medicaid and the, the Affordable Care Act. Um, so some of the things that worked really, really well um, that we did back with uh, kid care. So we, if you think about it, we centered us, so we're trying to enroll kids into health coverage, right? So thinking about where kids might be throughout the year, uh, we did things like library sign-up days, we partnered with faith-based organizations, we did like a faith month. Um, we had a Kid Care Awareness Month that we uh, did at the time. We had a whole campaign that was a Spanish language media campaign. Uh, we did back to school campaign when kids were going back to school. Um, and, and sort of um, outreach strategies like that. Um, I think most importantly for, for seniors, for grandparents in terms of um, helping kids in their family or kids in their community, uh, make sure that they're enrolled is asking that question because a lot of the time uh, we just we assume um, and it's asking that question of whether it's your adult child or uh, community members or a, in a faith-based uh, group in a church um, do your kids have health insurance did you know that there's a program that actually covers all kids uh, uh, regardless of documentation status so including undocumented kids in Illinois and provide them health coverage um, and if you don't, if they don't know that, then making sure that you are able to connect them with resources. And I think a resource like this uh, center can certainly make that connection for seniors who are trying to help um, their grandkids and other kids in their community. Thank you. <laughs> Henry? Yes. It's all well, yours. <laughs> good, mor <laughs> good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're here to celebrate the promise of a great society. I'm Henry Taylor, the Executive Director for the University of Illinois Health Center, Miles Square Health Center. It's been, we've discussed and talked about the statistics and the numbers, but frankly put, the process for expanding health care started back in 1912 with Teddy Roosevelt. The gauntlet was picked up as described by uh, President Truman, and signed into law by President Johnson in the presence of President Truman. An important part of our history. We're celebrating 50 years of Medicaid, 50 years of Medicare, and 50 years with the Community Health Center movement. 20 community health centers serve over 22 million Americans across the United States. There's a community health center in almost every congressional district in the United States. So we are proud to be a partner with CMS and our federal legislators and policymakers in the delivery of care. So thank you for the work you do in establishing the policy to allow us to deliver care in the neighborhoods on the grounds. Let me talk a little bit about Miles Square Health Center and why the community health center movement and partnership and the work we do is so, and you do and we do, is so important. <clears throat> Miles Square is one of the first community health centers in the United States. We are about 47 years old. We have over 30,000 lives assigned to us to care for is a medical home. We have 13 community health centers scattered throughout the Chicago and land area. We were very specific and are very specific in terms of providing care and placing these sites in some of Chicagoland's most underserved communities, economically stressed, underserved communities, being Inglewood, Back of the Yards, Cicero, 
and South Shore communities. We have five school-based sites and three mental health centers, uh, three uh, centers that focus on care for the chronically mentally ill with our College of Nursing. What makes Miles Square and the Community Health Center movement special? First, we have been shoulder to shoulder in delivering care regardless to the client's ability to pay. We will be there and are there regardless to your ethnic race, your sexual orientation, or your ability to afford care. We have been and will continue to be. That's our mission. That's our promise to you as a community health center. The University of Illinois, we are privileged as part of Miles Square to be part of the University of Illinois Medical Center. University of Illinois has seven health sciences colleges, which allow us to bring research into the community take the, the science, the knowledge from our ivory towers, of academic ivory towers, bring those into community health centers and deliver care in very unique ways. So we're proud of our relationship with the University of Illinois. We have a focus and a commitment to health equity. Our charge, our commitment is twofold. We will always be committed to providing care to the underserved. That's Miles Square's promise to you. We will be committed to providing and closing the health, the gap in health equity. We want to ensure that the families we receive, the families who come to us, know that they will receive respectful, compassionate, high quality care at a low cost. So we are pleased to be here this morning to celebrate the 350s or multiple 50s, Medicaid, Medica Medicare, and community health centers. So thank you so very much for having me today. Henry, as a follow-up, how are community health centers uniquely poised and capable of improving a community's health? Good question. Um, it's vital to understand that community health centers are organized a little differently than most of your um, ambulatory care or hospital-based services. First and most importantly, they're managed by a community board of directors. 50%, 51% of our board must, underline must, be consumers of our health services and live in the communities we serve. For us, that's extraordinary because we're able to bring in the thoughts, the wisdom of the community and base the care that's needed based on what they state the needs are. It's important for us to hear from our communities and create systems and processes and care that focus, and focus on the issues they've outlined. So community health centers, by having that relationship with communities, can directly can direct care to the needs of individuals in their local community and being managed by their own local communities. Okay. Thank you, Henry. You're very welcome. Mm -hmm. So at this time, we're going to turn to the question and answer period, and I think we're going to have an interpreter uh, join us now. Three minutes, maybe, peace in that great celebration and, and, and a moment. I just wanted to thank all of you to be here and with a great panel of experts. I'm so impressed with all you are saying. Um, um, CLEASE, Coalition of Limited English Speaking Elderly, is uh, over 25 years old. <laughs> so we just celebrated 25th anniversary last year. CLEASE plays a unique role in the aging network of our state. We serve limited English speaking older adults. Uh, through the network of providers of services. We currently have about 54 community-based social service agencies as members. Um, there are many, many languages spoken in this state. This is a very welcoming state. And let's remember, as Joyce said, immigrants and refugees are truly building Chicago. They contributing to the well-being of the communities, well-being of their families. And when they get older, not all of them necessarily truly understand the system and how to navigate the complex healthcare systems and, and such. So CLEASE is this cultural broker and it also plays an important role in bringing policies and, and regulations and explaining Medicare and Medicaid rules to people who might not be able to do so on their own. Um, I just wanted to say that CLEASE works closely with most of the people represented here with us with um, area agencies on aging especially City of Chicago and Age Options with the Illinois Department on Aging in our SHIP uh, program, which is such an, an amazing success. 
also mostly because of two ladies sitting with us today, Emerita and Grace. They're doing an extraordinary job engaging older adults in their communities and truly bringing medical knowledge and, and, and explanation of benefits to people who truly need those uh, benefits. Um, and also, we are part of various advocacy groups. We work closely with disability advocates and aging advocates. Uh, we do educate legislators about the needs and, and unique contributions of limited English speaking mm -hmm. older adults. Um, I just wanted to say that Medicare and Medicaid saves lives, saves people's lives, and lift people from poverty. Um, I believe uh, both Medicare and Medicaid give people uh, back their dignity and hope. So thank you for that. I will just be um, kind of looking for questions, and Emerita and Grace will be kind to translate them. So if anyone has any questions for any of our panelists. I am on Medicare and Medicaid, and I thank them very much for helping me. I have five, must, five ailments, you know, and people tell me, you don't look sick. I say, well, you can't see inside. <laughs> but I thank them very much. Thank yeah. you. That was very kind. Thank you. Because I have a problem that it could come to my home and do the work. I do it myself. Okay? Thank you. You want to tell them in Polish if they have any questions? Okay. Um, does anybody have uh, questions? Czy ktoś ma pytania po polsku? Czy ktoś ma? Proszę podnieść rękę, jeżeli ktoś ma pytania. My question is that they did mention Part D, but I. We don't hear anything about Part B. This is uh, very important uh, to uh, let in the people know the, what is in the cover, Part A, Part B, and Part D. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. That, that is a very good reminder. You're right. We all talked about Part D, probably because it's one of the newer benefits in the program. but. Part B is the cornerstone. And for anybody who has questions about Medicare Part uh, A or B, while you're here, we do have a booth, and we have members of our staff in the audience. So if you um, feel free to stop by the booth, and we'll do our best to answer your individual question. Any other questions? Anyone? OK, well, at, with that, then, I'm going to turn to Brenda Delgado to uh, close this out. And I just personally want to thank um, everyone involved in putting this together, but especially our panel. Um, just cannot say enough the important work that they do and how appreciative we at CMS are. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Well, thank you for joining us today. Just want to highlight one more time our partners who are also here exhibiting and providing answers for you. We have Keepro, um, otherwise known as our QIO. They are providing assistance to us here today. We have two wonderful staff from Social Security, Mayra Salazar, who also speaks Spanish, and Andy Salada, who also speaks Polish. So they're providing information here for Social Security. And we also have our senior health insurance program. They provide free assistance. They're located inside the senior centers, community centers, hospitals. But they're here today. And Jose Aviles also speaks Spanish as well if you have questions. And if you have questions for the ship or for Keypro and you need interpreters as well, we have our interpreters who are staying to help you with that as well. Otherwise, with that, I want to thank you for our, joining our program today. And we're going to be getting our cake ready. Uh, maybe we might get dessert before you eat lunch today. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>